Hey, everybody. Welcome to uh, another episode of the Fair Chase podcast. Excited to have you here. It's winter here in Michigan, so uh, we are looking for any and every excuse to get outside, even though it's cold. Although today it's it's raining, so I don't really know what's going on. It's, it's been negative degrees forever, and now it's just raining and probably like 35 degrees. So kind of, I don't know, that's classic Michigan for you. Um, so today we have um, a friend of ours. Uh, he's been on the show in the past, uh, but it's been a while. So Bo, Bo Martonic, I thought you'd ha I'd have you back on. So uh, for maybe people who haven't listened before, or this is their first time with the Fair Chase podcast or whatever, they don't, they've been living under a rock. Um, you want to give a little background of who you are and, and what you do? Yeah. So first of all, I, I apologize. We were supposed to do this podcast last I don't know, it might have been last summer and got into a, a busy time there and I lost track of it. And and first, so I wanted to apologize for you that, you that there. I meant to say it before we started recording. But it happens like every third guest. That That's how, and we do the same. So no, it's, yeah. it's totally fine. <laughs> no, and, I, and that's the same thing that happens from my point and uh, running a podcast and doing the exact same thing. But <laughs> anyways, I, so, so yeah, my name is Bo Martonic and, and I, I, majority i guess run the, the east meets west hunt podcast i guess that's what i'm most known for but i'm from pennsylvania and uh grew up hunting whitetails in and just kind of the middle of nowhere in the state hunting the big woods and stuff not i don't uh, have much farm country around where i grew up and hunt so it's just hunting a different area and and then also have a, an extreme love for going out West and, and kind of challenging myself at new things that, it, you know, every time I go someplace, I feel like I have no business being there from the standpoint <laughs> of it feels so new and, and difficult, but I really love doing that and finding that adventure in doing those. And, and really that's made me look at the way I whitetail hunt in a whole nother way. And sh being like, you can put a spin on whatever you want to make it the experience that, that you want to do, you know, and whether it's in Michigan or Pennsylvania or New York or, you know, upstate Minnesota, Wisconsin, there's all these places that have like this, you know, wilderness from an Eastern or Midwestern look of it that you can go out and have these adventure style hunts. I like doing out West back here. And it's just, it was just kind of twisting your mindset of how, how you look at those things. And that was kind of a lot of the, the thought process behind starting East meets West six years ago or so. And, and, and it really started with me wanting to learn more about hunting out West and being as a new person, I was like, when I started doing that, I had friends and family and, and anyone that had followed me at social media at the time of just being like, man, I really wish I could do an elk hunt like that but I, I don't have the money or the time. And I was like, man, it really didn't take that much. And, and I will say now there's a lot more information out there than there was at that mm -hmm. time. But that was my idea of like, from a selfish approach of like, I could interview people that I would not really ever get to talk to otherwise and ask them questions to help me become a better hunter out there. But also by throwing on the headset that I could help out some other people that were new to it and wanting to have those experiences because I truly believe those experiences have helped me out so much more in, in my life. And it's took me down a whole different route and becoming, you know, quote unquote entrepreneur and starting businesses and working on different things and where my life path was taking me at the time. And through that approach, I've, I started talking about how I grew up whitetail hunting in in the big woods and and hunting with my family and deer camp and all this stuff and i never would have guessed that that would have been like kind of the the ticket where everybody was there were so many people that related to that and hunted that way but there wasn't any media sources out there at the time that were doing anything about that kind of hunting so that that's kind of become the the bread and butter of it by accident and that's just the way i've grown up hunting and spend a lot of time hunting whitetails in those type of environments and it's it's funny we were talking a little bit beforehand you know you, you live in michigan and you living in pennsylvania they're they're very similar states mm -hmm. from the people that live there the hunting culture all those different things and i do have opportunity now with more time to go to these different places i was talking about i think i'm gonna draw an iowa tag this year i was like i haven't hunted a ton of like those big buck states in the Midwest and I love spending the rut in Pennsylvania. It's hard to pull me away from yeah. it. And it's like, why? But I love 
that that's where I like, I put my year round approach into doing it. And it's usually not going to result in, you know, the caliber of deer that you can find in other places in the country, but I don't really care. Cause I love that doing that and the people that are around me that do that as well. On X is the title sponsor of our podcast here at the Fair Chase, and it's a must-have app for all of us who love to explore the outdoors. Whether you're hunting or hiking or fly fishing, OnX gives you detailed, accurate maps right at your fingertips. With property boundaries, topographical features, and trail data, you'll always know where you are and where you're headed. You'll also likely be able to figure out where that big buck is headed to. Plus, their offline maps mean you're covered even in the most remote locations. OnX is the ultimate tool for outdoor navigation, making every adventure safer and more enjoyable. Download OnX today and explore with confidence. No, I, I love that. And say, I mean, so many things that you've said, we've said uh, before, and it's kind of our, our same thought process. Like if I could fill my walls with 120 inch Michigan deer, I would die with a big smile on my face, yeah. you know, like that, that would just make me happy. Um, cause you, it's like your own thing. You work on it all year. It's like, I, I live close to quite a bit of public land and I spend a majority of my time there. Um, you know, it's yeah. highly pressured, but I love it. And, you know, like even training, I, I saw you, you do a lot of stuff with Todd, Todd as well. Um, yeah. Like, to a couple times a week, he has you do a ruck, you know, and I'm always like, all right, I'm going to ruck to a spot I've never been to before to see if I can add one more little honey hole to my list of places in my area of a couple thousand acres of land that I can just know that, it, you know, I got another spot in my pocket. Um, and so yeah. there are, you know, they're big buck states and we've, you know, we hit them up. I shot a nice buck in Kentucky I think last, last year. Um, and it's that's cool and all and i you know i'm always gonna love and do that but there's yeah. something special about like for you pennsylvania for us michigan uh dear the other thing that i love that you said was <clears throat> start kind of using the podcast to to like have you gain your own information like we, i've yeah. said that so many times and like this is just an excuse for me to talk to people who probably i would never have been able to talk to and ask people who know like so much more about something than I do uh, to hopefully learn something and, you know, be better when I go wherever I want to go and, and hunt. So that's yeah. rings, rings true for us. Yeah. And, and the thing you said about the rocking, like going to different places, that's like exactly what I use those days yeah. for. I'm like, Hey, you know, Todd, like well, I remember when I was talking to him about the program, I was like, Hey, do you, is it like a problem if I don't just, you know, walk from here to here and back, you know, with a weighted pack and I go, check cameras or in the summertime I'll find I, I pick a different gate that I can park at to go to an area that <laughs> I hadn't been at before. Sometimes I'll drive, you know, 30 minutes to a place just so I can go hike for 45 to 60 minutes and then, you know, come back essentially. And I loved, and I just get an idea in the area and it's like, okay, next spring, maybe I want to come in here and yes. scout this out and check it out and do that. So I utilize that time a lot for those different I love that checking out different areas. The only thing that's been slowing me down lately is in Michigan, this like ridiculous rise of ticks, like so many more than I've ever seen. And so usually I'm like, I'll take my dog out. If it's win you know, winter, it's not been so bad, but we picked up a tick less than a month ago. Um, really? here in Michigan. <laughs> yeah. Like I've never had that before. So usually I'm like, all right, you know, let's go out. I'll take the dog. We'll just, you know, I'll, I'll be out there or whatever. Um, do it a lot in the spring and like he'll come back with ticks on him it's like and then i'm thinking about it some some kid right down uh, that we know kind of down the road got the alpha gale uh thing where you know he meat. can't eat red meat anymore he's a kid he got it on his eyelid and a uh, tick on his eyelid and i he got alpha gale and like it's it's not like you get a, a belly ache if you eat red meat it's like for i think for him i think it's a hospital run if he's and it's not always he's not always like has a problem with it sometimes he can have red meat and sometimes not it's like i don't want to mess i'd rather have lime if, if, you know yeah if that's the case you know yeah i do so i got lime probably 10 years ago and it created some food allergies for me but not meat so what's your, what's your allergies gluten and dairy me too Quick shout out to another amazing sponsor of ours, Kafaru International. If you're like us and love hunting in some of the toughest places, you know how crucial having the right gear is. Kafaru makes some of the toughest, most reliable backpacks and tents out there, 
and it's all made right here in America. Whether you're hunting in the backcountry or headed to your favorite deer stand, Kafaru has you covered. Keep your eyes out this year, especially as they're launching a ton of amazing new products like the new Arc frame that just came out. So next time you gear up for an adventure, make sure to check out Kafaru International. Hey, that's cool. really yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I Man. can't include. It makes backpacking, like like backcountry hunts, a little complicated, and especially because the meals that they have are are good. They work, but like yeah. the calories just are like not nearly as high as like a mountain house. Yeah. Have you found Almost, that? Yeah, and so it requires more food that you bring more, along and more space in your pack. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah because I, I know when I just went when I went up to Alaska last year, those guys were making fun of me because like I have gallon Ziploc bag absolutely stuffed to where you could yes. barely even zip it shut with food in there to hit my requirements, and those guys are just grabbing some bars here and so annoying and some some big meals. But I will say like. It makes you not saying that everything that doesn't have gluten and dairy dairy are healthier, but it helps you make better yeah. food choices because of because of that. So that's that's uh it's yeah, I, I look at it from a positive there. It's really hard for traveling, like if you're not like doing yeah. backpack stuff, like going to gas stations, it's it's become easier. There's more options than there used to be, but as you know, it's it's not not simple it's like a either. A, a gas station banana. I've I've eaten quite a few gas station <laughs> bananas, and it's like this is at least covered by a, a peel. We, I don't talk about it a lot on the podcast, but it's it does make um, things complicated, and it usually results in like I'll go out. You know, I think we did a bear. Was it two years ago? I went to Montana and did a bear hunt, and just was a little lower on the calories than I should have been. And I came back. I, I usually lose a, a bit of weight. Like I just kind of mm-hmm. go in knowing I'm going to kind of feel crappy for part of him, but probably lose some weight. Um, but I have managed to keep up because some of the guys will like bring like, Oh, here's some beer in the truck if we are successful. So what I started to do is I'll get a can of wine, you know, a celebratory can of wine. That's been my go-to, which, you know, it really, it's, um, it's about as cool as it gets, you know, shooting a bear and then grabbing a can of wine and, and cut it up. Um, but that's been like, you know, it's just like, it's extra planning. That's complicated. <laughs> Do you, um, so if you were to have, like, say you were to drink a beer, what does that do to you? Like, would you, do you do that from time to time or is it like a completely? I'm shut down. I, I've been, so let's see, I was going into my junior year of college. That had to be 20, 2008 or nine. So I haven't, I've been this way for like quite a while. Uh, okay. Um, and so if I were to have it now and I, I'm so allergic to gluten that coffee apparently is so similar to gluten and it's protein makeup or something where I've, if I've tried coffee in the past and it messes me up, like I've had like a piece of bread and it's like, I am, you don't want to be around. It's, uh, it gets a little hairy. So it's like, I pretty much shut that all down. Yeah. See, like for me, I there, if I'm at the end of like a hunt and I don't have to drive the next day and I don't have, (laughs) I'll have a beer to like, is like a celebratory thing because what it does to me is I have stomach problems from it. But the worst part is I get such bad brain fog and tiredness that I just want to sleep and I can't stay awake and I can't have a good conversation. And so it's been, yeah, probably, well, I had Lyme disease for, you know, it's been about 10 years or so, maybe, maybe 11 years. And I didn't find out that I had these problems from it until a couple of years after. So it was like 2014, 15, somewhere in there yeah. when I found that out. And I tried like being like, Oh, acting like it wasn't real. And yeah. that didn't, yep. that didn't help me. And then once you cut it out, it makes it worse to when you have yes. a little bit again, and dairy is not as bad. Like dairy mostly gives me like some a headache and really serious congestion. And then like, yeah just some stomach problems, but it's not the end of the world for having that or gluten. If I have to do anything serious or, or, uh, um, like if I need to be like mentally sharp, it's yeah. not the best. It's not a good move. I can't, I can't do it. It's rough. I, I initially had more, I couldn't have eggs for years or peanut butter or peanuts. Uh, and I did finally, I was so tired of it. And my wife and I, was, I had food allergies and we kind of got in this weird car accident. Um, where I was with, she was my girlfriend at the time we were underwater for 
quite a while and kind of got some messed up from, it was really in a drain. So it's like drainage water on the side of a road. Um, just bad accident messed us up, but it made me have quite a few more food allergies. Um, and actually I ended up knocking them out. I did this pretty intense called gaps, like, like the, sh like the, uh, the store gap gaps. It's like a diet where you like slowly cut down to like, you're eating like broth for a few, like you cut things down for over the period of a month or whatever it is. And, um, and then you add things back in. I got some foods back. So I kind of in the same way I can have butter now after doing gaps and kind of, kind of dipping into that every once in a while just to heal my gut. But uh, yeah, definitely is not expecting to talk about this, but it definitely no. does make all this, like, it just makes all the planning, like just a little bit more tricky. It does. Yeah, it really does. You really got to be ready. And like when I go to, I was just in Ohio for a muzzleloader deer camp and like going there instead of like, if you're going with a bunch of guys and being like, Oh, I'll bring the hamburger buns. I'll bring this. It's like, Hey guys, how, you guys are all on your own for food. Yeah. Like you guys can yeah. do what you want and I'll just bring what's what I need. And I just kind of <laughs> segment it of like, I'll bring say enough meat if we're going to cook a big meal. Maybe I just won't have the bun or whatever with it. Yeah. But for the most part, it was like, don't worry about me for anything else that because then they'll be like well can you have uh you know bagels does that have gluten in it yeah yeah it <laughs> actually, does extra, you know yeah <laughs> actually yeah actually that'll that'll put me down pretty hard you know it's like so i instead of explaining that it's just like i'll bring my own stuff kind of have it there and it's yeah i'm glad i'm glad to know i'm glad to hear this i did not know this about you i feel like sometimes man you're like i'm the only one i hate it i feel like a loser i want to be part of the I, so last year we went on a we did this boat based uh bear hunt in alaska and so you you get on you've got the captain and when one of the guys on on the boat is like your cook and he was a hawaiian guy big dude <clears throat> i get on I'm like hey i brought my own food you know i might need to use a burner on the boat or whatever but like and he's like, he looks at me and he's like, nope, by the end of the week, I'm going to get you to eat my food. I'm like, no, probably not, because then I'm just going to be on the boat the whole time. And so he he tried a bunch over the over the course of the you know 10 days or whatever we were there. At the end, I know, I know he was offended and upset. Like he was not, he was mad at me that I wouldn't try his food. I'm, and I'm just like, I don't, I wish I could. It's not personal, yeah. you know. It, this isn't me, you know, <laughs> thinking that you're a you're a bad cook. Yeah. This is me trying to look out for myself and yeah. and this money and you guys, I spent really. on this trip. Yeah, and everybody yeah. else. <laughs> you're gonna have a bad time too. This episode is also brought to you by Two O Gear, innovators in technical hunting clothing. Two O is a newer company. It's based right here in Michigan. And whether you're hunting elk in the mountains or chasing antelope in the plains or traipsing through swamps after that ruddy buck, Two O has you covered with premium jackets and pants, merino wool layers, everything you could possibly need to stay comfortable in the woods. Their products are engineered for functionality and durability, ensuring you stay protected in any conditions. Plus, their camo is really effective. We were big fans. So don't take our word for it though. Go to two gear.com and check it out. So anyway, so, um, so you're, you've, you've been doing this stuff and like I said, it, it's been super fun to follow and you know, the content you've put out over, like you said, six years has been great. We, I read it actually quite a bit and, and use it for myself. Cause you could, you're doing a lot of the mountain whitetail stuff and you know, we're often in big woods. I don't hunt ag mostly because I don't have ag to hunt. So I'm hunting in yeah. big woods, right? Um, and so been really cool to follow, uh, you know, all the posting, I, I think you, I've seen you write in meat eater and like, I saw you were doing like an outdoor class thing yeah. too, which is pretty cool. Yeah, no, that, that was fun. So basically an online course that was just about scouting big woods, whitetails and just kind of my approach to from start to finish, how I kind of break down an area, go in and, and try to find bucks that I want to hunt. Yeah. Are you, so are you uh are you a whitetail expert yet? Can you can you say when will you claim to be I, or I don't you... think I don't think that there's that term is is real. <laughs> yeah. I think there's always so much to learn about whitetails and animals in general. Like there's I I I don't know more than I know about yeah. it. But I you know, I feel obviously I've spent a lot of time doing it and I I feel confident in my approaches on things but that does not mean that i that i would claim for myself to be an expert <laughs> yeah I, to I totally agree because i feel like an expert in my mind is like oh i could go out there and we could shoot a buck 
And I feel like I'm just getting better at making the odds go a little bit higher in my yes. favor, as opposed to knowing just like, I know that if I do this, there's a chance I get lucky out there and, and shoot a deer, you know, and that's, that's where I'm, and I'm, that's what I'm hoping for. And I feel like I never want to be an expert because then I, I think maybe I'd be sick of it. I want to keep being bad at yeah, it. Yeah. And it's, yeah, no, it's, it's no matter what, like, and that's one thing I've also learned from the podcast and interviewing people that I look up to and are like, man, these are really successful people is they all struggle too. It's just trying to learn things enough and have enough experiences that you can make the right guesses some of the time to yeah. make it work out, you know? And that's like, so I, I'm trying to look for odds multipliers of like how I can put myself in a better position more times than I will you know, were and or would in the past. So that's, yeah. that's kind of how I look at learning and, and, and deer hunting specifically is just trying to give myself a better experience based off of other experiences that I've had in the past. I love that. My, my day job, I, I, I'm in sales. We do a lot of consulting and a lot of it's around like having a growth mindset. So we will work with pretty big organizations and like, like Microsoft and helping them uh, teach their people to have a growth mindset is basically being you see the world as like you have skills and that you have innately that you can expand upon and things that you're not good at that you can grow and, and become good at as opposed to like a fixed mindset that where people are like well i was born a savant you know and this i'll never get better or worse i'm you know, i'm good at x or whatever um and you know everybody says they don't but they always over index on you know people who are naturally good at something um so like the LeBron James, like a natural athlete, he works hard, obviously, too. But, you know, we love that story as opposed to the guy who failed, you know, the, the Abraham Lincoln, you know, kept failing, failing and finally, finally made it. So, I mean, I love taking that approach to, to deer. And it's it's just and honestly, um, as I've learned to have that in my life and especially, you know, we're talking deer hunting now, it's it's made it more fun. It's made it more like the end of a season isn't really the end of a season. It's the end of that part of a hunt. And like, now you're into a different part of the hunt. So, you know, it's January. Now we're done with deer season, the hunting part. Now I'm in the other phase of like hunting, which is, you know, learning new spots or, or whatever, whatever you decide to do in, in January. So that's, that's been, it's been helpful to me. Yeah. Like, so an example would be is like, for, for me, this past season in Pennsylvania was one of the most difficult ones that, that I'd had to date as far as this is the this is the first year that in a long time where i didn't fill a buck tag and it it hurts like i i feel it in every <laughs> piece of my bone and for no other reason than i put so much pressure on myself because of how much time i put into it and try yeah. really hard and the thing is is like i was just talking to somebody else about this the other day i was like i had the best season that i ever have had in you know a couple of moments if they would have just been flipped a millisecond or an inch like yep. that could have changed it to me being like man i best had the best season, season ever, ever. And, yeah. and and it's crazy how like those little you know what they say it's a, it were life is just you know a series of moments and it's like if one of those moments would have been just a little bit different it would it would change that but what that allowed me to do was hunt the full season like i hadn't i hadn't hunted late season archery or flintlock muzzler with a buck tag in my pocket and i can't tell you how long and like that was really cool to see that and i had some cool experiences encounters and stuff that was like i traditionally wouldn't have seen that and it helps even from the experience standpoint if i'm talking to somebody that say i'm interviewing somebody on the podcast that specializes in hunting late season it's like okay i have more experience with that to be able to to talk to people about like i've scouted a lot during yeah. that time and i've you know ran trail cameras so you have that but to actually have that in-person experience of doing that for that time period is 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 valuable for future years is the way i look at it and and you know coming into you know january like this this time period for me is really reflecting on like the things that went right and yeah. then the things that went wrong and figuring out how can I make sure that those things don't go wrong again, or I don't make those mistakes to be able to, you know, close the deal essentially. And instead of uh, be sitting here wondering like, Oh, I wish I would have done that. Or, you can't, in my opinion, you can't 
dwell on it for too long yeah. is like you can't feel bad for yourself you can for a little bit you can throw a little fit but like <laughs> that's that that only goes so far as far as like trying to figure out all right what's next and yeah and i was talking to a relatively new hunter that hunts the big woods the other day through social media and they were saying they're like man i'm struggling you know so bad and blah 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 and, and they were telling me this and i'm like he's like what am i doing wrong i'm like it sounds like you're doing a lot of the things right you just got to do it more. Like it's, yeah. it's going to take, it's, you're going to, if I said, if I listed out all of my screw ups throughout the year, you'd be like, Oh my gosh. Like how, you know, yeah. how's this guy what an idiot. anything? Like, yeah, yeah. Like I've screwed up so many times and, and, and so many occasions. And that's just, that's what happens. And my goal is to try to minimize those year after year. And sometimes you go backwards, but you got to keep thinking or keep trying to put, focus on those weaknesses and elevate those strengths that you gained. You know, like for me, a big win this past year was like every season that I hunted and every place that I went, I had an encounter that could have turned yeah. into me feeling yeah. a tag. And I was like, that's a big win. Like I felt really good about that. What I didn't feel good with was the execution standpoint, whether, you know, <laughs> whether it was missing, uh, missing a buck or, moving at the wrong time or not being present and jumping a deer when I was still hunting, like things yeah. like that are like, all right, how do I improve on those things to be able to close the deal? I'm getting better with the, the standpoint of finding them and creating those opportunities, which was a struggle in the past. And now it's yeah. like, okay, <laughs> now those are coming up. It's just, but, and I feel like you talk to me 20 years from now, there'll be something else that, you know, I'm trying to get, better at and you know that i'm okay yeah i'm doing really good making the shot every time but i went backwards in this realm or you know yeah. i'm in a new environment and i'm trying to learn how to hunt in this type of area so big thanks to vortex optics for sponsoring this podcast as well most hunters know how important clear reliable glass is in the woods in fact we don't hit the woods without some form of optics in our hands Vortex Optics offers a wide range of high quality binoculars and scopes and range finders, things that are perfect for hunting or bird watching or whatever you're doing outside. Their world class products also come with an amazing warranty. I've actually used it and it's really fast and easy to use. So, whether you're spotting a big bear across a drainage or lining up that perfect shot, make sure you're doing it with Vortex Optics. That's, that's kind of how I look at it. I love it. And I love that too. It's like, if you're not so serious about it, um, and you, if you get too serious or too tied up in one part of hunting, which is like, if I shoot that deer and I, I'm going to post it on social media and people are going to think I'm great. It's like, you, you, I mean, you won't learn anything. Uh, you're going to end up frustrated. And if you do well, you're going to have like an angsty feeling still. And I, I've been there. And like the more I've let go of it, the more I've been willing to try things that I wouldn't like that are sometimes just idiotic. Like I'm trying things out in the woods, new things uh, just to learn myself that I could be great or could be stupid. Um, and I've kind of been like, you know, if, if you hold on like a little looser to being whatever successful shoot, shooting a buck or whatever out there, you have more fun and you're also, you just learn more. Like I've tried to get to the point where, you know, you read, tons of things online that give you tons of things, what to do and what not to do. Never do this. Always do this. I love this. I hate this. Um, and I've kind of tried to go backwards and being like, well, is that true or not for me where I hunt? Um, and what that means is like, I'll regularly go try things that people would say you should never do that. Uh, you know, I hunt a lot from the ground, for example, I'll, I'll hunt in the mid, like I'll hunt in a field sitting in the grass, waiting for, you know, deer to walk by me in the grass and try to pull just like things that like people generally would not encourage you to do for hunting. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I don't want to take their word for it. I want to try it for myself. It's fun to try it for myself. Then I know for sure. And that's how I learn best. I can read something and you can ask any of my teachers this. I'll read something and I don't necessarily learn it so well unless I go out there and it, you know, either really works well or really sucks. Um, and, and it's led to like this year, I, you know, shot a buck off the ground, um, where I walked out cause I couldn't get out earlier. It's eight 30 in the morning light out. Right. So I'm sneaking out, come up on a buck, making a rub on a tree, you know, basically got to 13 yards and shot him right off the ground, um, off a path, awesome. just, just bizarre things. But it's like it, old me would have been like, Nope, I didn't get out an hour and a half before dark. 
I'm not going to, I'm not going to even go to a new place on public land, which is what I did where I shot this. I'm just going to leave it alone. And, and, you know, and instead it's like, no, just, I'm going to, this is what I have to work with. I'm going to come up with a plan. Maybe it's a stupid plan. That I'll be embarrassed to tell anybody about, um, but I'm going to try it anyways. Yeah. And, and the thing is, I, I believe that there is no absolutes in deer hunting. And also no matter who you listen to, you could look at, me and be like, oh, wow, Bo's had a lot of success in this area. And I'll talk about something confidently because it's what I believe in based off my experiences. That doesn't mean that that exact scenario is the best case scenario for where you're at. And it goes for everybody bases their thoughts and opinions off of what they have experienced and where they're at. And I think that's important to know because... Mm-hmm. Now, now, with that being said, you can learn a lot. Say if you were to come to me and be like, man, this situation, I always see these deer going through this tall grass. I can look at my scenario and be like, man, there's this, this swampy area with some tall grass there. I should go check it out. And maybe they're using this, this wood line over here and this brush on the edge of the grass to travel through. And that might be the ticket versus just going through the grass or mm-hmm. just going through the swamp. And it's just like you start to... That, that's how I learn at least or how I look at learning from people and even like the guests that I'll have on the podcast and talking with them. I'm like, how can that apply to where I'm at? And then try to see that through to, to gain your own experiences and your come to your own conclusions on what you think is going on. And every deer is so different. Everyone has its own personality and they like to do different things. And that's, it's why there's uh <clears throat> it's never ending and there will always be a need for uh, hunting content out there as far as tips and tactics and all this stuff, because there's not a rule for, yeah. for no, anything that fast. works in one way. No, I told, sorry, my dog is hacking in the background. So I promise that's not, <laughs> not me. Uh, I know I, I kind of had this switch flip or flip switch. I had the light go on uh, with a, uh, a, a pod. I don't really listen to a lot of podcasts, but I, I was listening to one of uh, this guy, hunts in Wisconsin. I can't, I don't even remember who it was, but he gets in a swamp and he's like, sits in the swamp. He like, will put up a chair and sit in the water and like shoot deer real close. And like, he find, found success that way, like a lot. And I got to thinking, I'm like, man, I would never have thought to do that. I would have thought that's a terrible idea, you know, getting in there and, and this guy makes it happen. And I started thinking like, well, what other things that I think couldn't be done or were a terrible idea. And I never actually tested for myself. So um, no, it's, it's, it's fun. That's what's so fun about hunting, especially, you know, talking about hunting in your own backyard or a place that you can spend season after season and really build yeah. up, build up knowledge. Definitely. Uh, um, yeah. Which, and you don't always get that going out West, like, or, you know, on a travel hunt, travel hunts, you're like there for a little while. You learn it for as much as you can for the week that you're there, try to make it happen and, and roll out. So, um, well, let's, let's take it, um, let's make it like more pertinent for people right now so it's you we're, we're recording this it's january 23 probably this will go out in the next week or so so early february maybe um people are either you know recovering from the 2023 season i'm sure a few folks are out there hunting still um, but a lot of us are starting to think about next fall and already starting to think about scouting so you know I, I want to talk about that. And I, I, as I'm thinking about doing this podcast with you, I saw you posted recently this um, really important bit about not pressuring deer during this time of the season, you know, before we jump into scouting and talking about that, you want to explain a little bit about what you mean by pressuring deer right now and what, why to maybe avoid it. Yeah. I, so one thing that I noticed in, in my area where I'm at in Pennsylvania, I knew it was pretty similar in a lot of the Northern States and some of the Midwest is we had some really cold weather that had pushed through with a bunch of snow and then some of it melting and turned to ice and then more snow, which creates a really tough situation for the deer, especially when you get a layer of ice underneath there, because they can't dig the brows up on the ground and they're reliant on, especially in these big woods areas where there's not, a lot of ag and even then that's tough for them to be able to feed but they have to browse anything that's above the ground essentially to be able to yep. do it and they're there's you know they're already stressed from just getting out of hunting seasons and pressured and then you add this the weather and everything and, and deer are adaptable they're highly adaptable but my thought process on that is i was i was going out because i was like oh i'm going to take my rock and go out and pull some cameras and 
really, I was like, I was thinking about it and I'm like, these conditions are just not good for me to go to certain areas because I don't want to go into these bedding areas and kick deer up and put additional stress on them when I'm seeing them up feeding at one o'clock in the afternoon because they're trying to, yeah, they're, bulk they're trying up to keep their, yeah, trying to keep their bodies up and after the rut that happened just, you know, a month or so before. And it just, it's something that I've, I've kind of had this like rule myself of like during hard winters to not make sure that I'm being selfish and trying to go out and pick up sheds or whatever else in bedding areas and, and shed huntings become extremely popular to the point where there's people out all the time, you know, sometimes in December, in the January, all this stuff when they're just trying to be the first one to get in there and check it out. And, and I get that, but at the same time, we, <clears throat> we need to self-regulate a little bit and think about how the deer are responding to that. I had one guy say, Oh, you just want to get out there and find the sheds before everybody <laughs> else. And it's like, yeah, no, that's, that's it. not, that's yeah. It's like, that's not the, the reasoning behind it. But it, I, I think we, sh we should think about our own conditions and that, that, you know, it could be completely different for somebody that's in Georgia or somewhere else. So it's not, again, it's just use your own gut feeling in your head to look at what the situation is and, and especially during these these winter months when it's really hard on the deer to make sure that we're not we're not causing additional stress on them that suffers with their health. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I mean, stress is going to affect. I mean, not only whether they live, uh, but like for the guys and and gals that like are really into you know getting your helping your bucks grow to their biggest potential, like stress will directly impact the uh, antlers 100%. that they grow. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. And I've also seen on, uh, and a couple guys commented on the post that seen similar was with, uh, the coyotes were, you know, you'd see deer going across the camera and they're, they're the deer up to their, almost to their shoulders and snow and the coyotes are running across the top of it. You know, they'll yeah. come through in another picture and it's like, maybe they're directly chasing them. Maybe they're not, but it, that is a time when if, some, if a deer is weak, that a coyote, you know, a coyote. The deer are very aware of that fact. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, most definitely. So that's, that's just something to, to consider with thinking. And, and that doesn't mean like you can't go out. And like one of the things that I was trying to do is like, okay, middle of the day, if I, if I can get out on a Saturday or whatever, I'll go to open feeding areas where they're not likely to be bedded and you know, check cameras or, or pull cameras or doing whatever I need to do versus going in like the thermal cover and those places that you're probably going to find deer bedded at and, and yeah. kick them out. So, and, and also like, there's so many other things that you can be doing. I'm a very analytical person. So this time of year, like I was saying, I'm going through all the things I did right and wrong. And I'm also taking my journal notes and my trail camera pictures and I'm putting on my computer and I'm looking at okay, what are some trends I was seeing with dates and times when deer were moving and when did I have my best hunts? Why did I have them that way? And then starting to look at maps as far as like, all right, where do I want to start my scouting when I'm really getting into some of these batting areas in March and April and trying to peel apart properties, whether it's places that I've hunted, you know, for the last six, seven years or brand new places that I want to check out and put a plan together. So when you do get time, you can make the most of it when that comes up. Yeah. No, I love that. And that's, I mean, that's, that's kind of what we do too. It's like, honestly, if the snow is super deep and it's really cold, maybe just give the, the deer a minute, you know, right yeah. now we're, you know, things are somehow melting in Michigan again, we're going to probably lose all of our snow uh, here pretty quick. And so at some point I'll, I'll probably jump in and, and do some light scouting and, you know, places where there I know deer go and where I don't feel like I'm pressuring them too much. They've got some food around. It's like you said, it's a judgment call. Um, so for, for folks that will be out there um, that are like, hey, this is a time, you know, I want to get out. I want to get a jump start. I know preparate. I shouldn't just wait till September 1 to go scout deer. I should be doing it a little earlier than that. Um, what are some things that you're focused on, like right now from here to March, maybe the beginning or mid-March? So again, if you are analytical like me and you like looking at back here, if you run trail cameras and whatever else, like I, it's a really good time to go through your cards, organize your photos, kind of look at the dates and times and 
look at that because trail cameras are a useful tool, but yeah. I feel like even from talking to people, a lot of people they're using cell cams and stuff. Now they get the pictures, they look at them and that's kind of it. And, but you forget about that information. And for someone like me that doesn't always remember every detail and every photo and everything that comes through, I need to put that down and look at it and kind of create like, okay, this area got hot from October 20th to the 25th. Why was that? Start asking these questions like what what was going on there? What made sense? Okay, there was a good oak crop or there was a good black cherry crop there. Maybe some does come into heat in that area that time of year. I'm going to make note of that for future years. And I'm trying to gather all the stuff I learned in the season and putting it in a way that's beneficial going forward. And then I'm looking at putting together plans of – where I want to get in in the spring and scout because you only have so much time between at least where I'm at where the snow melts and green up Mm -hmm. and that's a very crucial time for me to to get in and and scout and I, I would say that I feel like I kill a lot of my bucks in the spring based off of that scouting for that that upcoming year now there's there's nothing that can replace the real time intel but you can help predict that real time intel better by having that historical stuff when you're when you're out there looking. And that's and the the other thing that I'll say about if you're going into an area in, in the spring and scouting it and checking it out, have an idea in your mind on when you're gonna spend the most time in the woods. If you take a week off during the mm. rut, your scouting should probably be a little bit more focused on rut timing versus okay, I'm yes. gonna, you know, take the first week of the season off that's a whole different set of signs and stuff that you're looking for. And I've always been very rut focused in a lot of my scouting because that's when I always had the time off of work at the time to do that. Now I have a little bit more flexibility and hunt more of different times of the season, but I, I think you can get, you can get too overwhelmed by trying to look at everything versus if you have kind of a focused approach on how you're, you're going through and scouting an area, I think you can learn more. I love that because I mean, scouting is basically, well, first of all, you're pre-scouting a place to scout in the winter, which is interesting. But what you do with scouting is a lot of, a lot of, at least the way I look at it is I'm crossing off places that I, I don't like. Um, and so if you're, and you're, so you're narrowing down. Um, and so if you are trying to narrow down efficiently, a, a good thing to think about and something that I don't, I've not heard a lot of people talk about. It's like, all right, well, when are you spending most of your time hunting? Is it the pre-rut? Is it the rut? Is it post? Yeah. What, what is that? What, what is it for you? And for example, for me, um, I hunt pretty evenly all year round, but I will hunt a lot more in the mornings. You know, I've got, um, a daughter, I've got extracurricular oh. stuff, youth groups, and, you know, all these things that parents and, you know, adults have, um, but I'm able to hunt most mornings. And so when I'm out, I'm looking for ways that deer will, I can ambush a deer in the morning, um, in all times of year. And having that, at least that awareness has been effective for me because I mean, there could be a great evening spot and yeah, I should like have that in my brain for later. Should I get out? Cause I still do hunt the evenings, but I'm spending a majority of my time hunting in the mornings. Yeah, and and that's such a good point. One thing that that I learned as I'm evolving my scouting in the spring is I, you know, I've always I've had a goal since well, it's probably been almost ten years now where I do 200 miles every spring. Of that's what I want to do to feel like I've accomplished hitting yeah, that's cool. my normal areas plus other areas, and I track it. Just have my watch and I track every one. Garmin, and I just yeah, Garmin. Yep, same, there we yeah, go. That's the, that's the same one. <laughs> And so I, I, and I, it just kind of gives me like that goal to work yeah. towards and, you know, the competitive nature against yourself of like, okay, I'm falling behind and it doesn't, you don't have to have, you know, 200 miles. It can be 40 miles or 50 miles, whatever you have the time to be able to do. But I'd say even before I went full time and doing the podcast and stuff before I was doing any of this, I actually put more time in the spring when I was like early twenties out of college and got my, you know, my first, you know, real big time job. Yeah. And I'd get out of work at four and every single day until dark, I'd be out, I'd go and walk and just walk an area. And I got really good at finding sign. But what I learned was come hunting season, I was like, well, how do I access this? Yeah. What, <laughs> you know, what tree do I need to be in? And so like now I spend, I'd rather spend more time 
in an area learning it through and if i find a good spot stop there for 30 45 60 minutes and walk around and look and try to pick out trees see what kind of wind that's going to make the most sense dropping milkweed figuring out how this setup lays out why that signs there seeing it all right now how am i going to access this if i'm going to hunt in the morning all right how am i going to get in here without spooking any deer yeah. to be able to that's 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 super difficult and like what tree do I need to be in? How many sticks do I think I need to go high if I'm going to get in this tree? What way should I face? You know, what way is the sun going to come up? I mean, there's all these different questions I ask myself and it's not to overcomplicate it, but it makes it easier when that comes that you don't run into these problems that you're learning during that valuable hunting time. And like the reason for pre-scouting with maps and everything before I even go in and scout an area is to try to be the most efficient with the time and that you have. If you only have, you know, half of a Saturday to be able to go through in an area or, you know, you've got, you know, you've got kids sports or you got things that are going on that you can't spend, you know, three days breaking down an area. It's like, how can I be the most efficient in this time in this area and hit those key points? And then, you know, you, you don't, I mean, when I mark places on a map, I want to check out, I don't, exactly go to every one of those points but it gives me a starting point and yep. all of a sudden i start seeing sign that's leading me this way and i might go a different direction but it gets me it gets me rolling in the right direction yeah it gets you in that area the, the broader area yeah. and then you kind of just you key in on different things when you're in the moment um and, and that's such a huge part of even you know having and we, we talk about gear, like gear doesn't make you a good hunter, but having the right gear does allow you to be a good hunter. So to be able to go out there with stuff that's light and you can pop up uh, when you need it in, in different situations. I mean, that just, I mean, we, we've seen it. We talk about this a lot, but it, it opens you up to just being extremely flexible. Cause like you said, you've got, you got a pinpoint spot, but it could be, you know, a 10 acre area that you're like, it's in here is pretty good. And when I get there, I guess I'll, I'll figure it out. And, you know, like I said, I'll, oftentimes I'm morning hunting. And so I'll be doing that in the dark, you know, it's like, I've been here ish before. Um, you know, I'm figuring it out as I go in the dark and often I'm climbing up in dead trees and doing all stuff. That's pretty stupid. You know, you, I'm yeah. sure you've done it. You get your saddle, you look up, it's like, Oh, there's uh, this is a dead tree and just going to slowly back down now, you know? Oh, I, I did it. I did it this past year, even where a tree I marked, you know, in the spring, I was like, this is a good, I did, but I just, I didn't spend much time. I was just like, okay, inside quarter, this clear cut edge. I got to scrape over there, run yeah. camera on, <laughs> you know, this would work for this wind. That triple cherry tree looks pretty good. And I just walked away and went back in there hunted start climbing up realizing the tree's pretty hollow and <laughs> i stayed in there which was not smart but it starts swaying around on the top of the branch i'm like not again you know yeah, i need to not again. <laughs> i need to pay attention to this a little bit more and like so those are all things that in the spring you can help make those decisions and yeah. like I, it seems like every year i i always come back to like i need to spend more time figuring out i find so many good spots but really fine tuning those good spots and see you have a thousand acres that you can scout you're not going to be able to walk every square inch of that area so it's yep. like finding those key points once you start finding the sign now maybe you spend a couple hours in this small you know 10 acre spot and really learning the intricate details of it and then moving to the next one and it's like spent you know moving quickly through areas that don't mean as much and then once you find those areas that are you know where you think maybe deer are living or bedding whatever now it's like breaking that down in the springtime you're not worried about you know pressuring them from the standpoint of blowing them out or having any worries there it's like everything's going to be done and and back to normal by the time hunting season comes around so it's like exactly use that to your advantage and and break those places down yeah. And obviously, you know, like be, being sensitive to deer being pressured this time of year and, and being sensitive to the times you go out. So you're not too close to hunting season. I think the end, at the end of the day, honestly, it's just the more time you can spend in the woods doing anything, just it just being around, it will make you better. You know, even if it's like, I don't even know what I'm looking for. I'm just going out today. Um, do it. Uh, I mean, yeah. it's good for you anyways, but like you, it will help it always helps. It's never a waste, never a waste to do that. Just ask yourself why. I mean, you don't always yeah. have to know 
all the key terms and all this stuff and have all the analytics that I'm talking about here. Like that's, that's just kind of where, how my brain works and how it functions. But if you just go out and you start finding deer tracks and you ask why, why are these deer tracks here? Yeah. Okay. And you start following them and then all of a sudden you can see some briars that are browsed off. It's like, Oh, there's some food here, some briars and everything. And you just start putting pieces together of this puzzle and you find a rub. And then you see another one down over there. It's like, okay, this is a direction of travel. Let me follow that and see where, where it leads to. Oh, I followed it the wrong way. It's going out to the middle of these open woods, probably at night. Let me go backwards. And oh man, all of a sudden I found a cluster of rubs around this thick area. There's a chance a deer's living here at some point. You know, you yeah. don't. And 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 the way I, I always look at areas in a three year approach, I I don't believe that you can possibly learn everything you need to learn in one year of being in a spot and one spring of going through there because you need that actual experience of hunting there to learn more about how the deer are doing that or you might miss some key stuff and so like you can always get lucky and and shoot a deer the first time in a spot 100 mm -hmm. and you can and i shouldn't say just lucky you could have enough information that it that works out but I feel like if you keep going back to the same areas and learning more and more, all of a sudden you start compiling all these pieces of the puzzle together. I'll give you an example, an area that I'd only ever spring scouted uh, for three years. I ran cameras there too, but I found them like, man, there's all this good bucks on there, but I never hunted it. Well, I actually stopped running cameras there two years ago. And this, I was like, I was, when I had a tag for rifle season, I was like, where are places that I've seen bucks in late season? I was like, man, I remember having a bunch of trail camera uh, evidence of these bucks in the middle of the day walking around in gun season on this side hill. There's this old clear cut and there must be a safe zone for them. And it was like, okay, this is a ways away from the road. There's access here, 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 but below it, there's a river. So it's like, okay, that's why they're laying on that face when all this pressure comes from these other different angles. Yeah. And I went in there and it was like, it was like buck central. There was, there was bucks everywhere. And during gun season, and I was like, man, that Intel, it helped me, but it took me a few years of being in there and scouting to really learn that. And, you know, a after you do it for a while, you start gaining more of those places and things that you can go back in your memory and places change. I mean, there's, areas that will go hot and go cold but it's like if you scout multiple areas and have these things in your in your in your bag of tricks or your places then you can go in and do that and that's why when i every year i break down i try to have three to four main hunting areas that i know super well and i've have experience in in the past and then i have two to three that are kind of newer areas that I have that I have ideas I've scouted it, but I haven't, I don't have a whole lot of Intel, but I can all of a sudden one's getting more pressure than I thought I can move to the next yeah, one. Exactly. This one's something happened that they're logging in there, changed up all their patterns. I don't know exactly what's going on. I can bounce to the third one and you have these different plans. And it just, for me, I try to, the scouting is to help me not stress about, you know, finding deer or if situations throw you off, whether it's people or logging or you name it, you know, EHD in places like all that stuff by having multiple options, it helps you be able to move kind of on the fly without worrying about, I don't know where to hunt. Yeah, no, it's huge. I, I do the same thing. It's like, cause it, especially on public land, some, at some point, something's going to get blown up for some reason or another and I, you know, will find myself mid October, the lull or whatever. And it's like, well, all the deer are doing something else. Now I have to adjust and I have to dig into my, my bag of tricks or my, my spots that I've, you know, been thinking about and saving for the, this whole year, uh, for this time specifically. And I feel like, you know, mid October, that happens to a lot of guys, you know? Um, yeah. Well, and, and another point I want to say about that is like about say hunting pressure that comes in. You know, us as, as people that put media out there, you know, we get a bad rap for like, okay, we're, you know, bringing more people in and all this different stuff. And, and, you know, to a point, there can be some truth that, that comes from that. But what I'll say is like from someone that's spent my whole life hunting, 
every time a, a you know locally looking at very small scale locally anytime someone killed a big buck and it goes in the paper and or just it doesn't go in the paper and people find out they always find out where it was at and that area will get flooded for a period of years until everyone's frustrated because there's so many people there and they move out and the area becomes good again yeah, yeah. all areas go in ebbs and flows and it's just trying not to let that you know disrupt your hunting experience and just being like that's part of it relax you know, about it a little bit whether it's public it can be private that a lot of people have access to it doesn't matter like just have fun with that part of it and and just understand that things are going to change and that's just part of the nature yeah no and i think i mean generally it's just going with just being flexible being willing to learn being willing to adjust because that's what makes hunting fun. That much makes that's what makes people better at hunting than other people. Um, uh, just and that's honestly what makes just it more fun. Like you just are relaxed. It's it's not a thing that you should be emotionally so tied up with all the time. And I'm I'm a you know I've had I've struggled with that in my life, so I can't yeah. say I'm like the king of that. But but having that better mindset about about hunting, being flexible, understanding that these things happen. You know, having a plan B, C, D, E, F and all the other rest of the letters of the alphabet. And I do know them all in order. Um, you know, it, it's good. It's good to have them. It's good to have them in your back pocket. Um, Bo, we we've got, we're running out of time. Um, but, uh, you've got, I mean, you have tons of information out there on this stuff. You've written about it extensively on your website, tons of other websites, you got videos and everything else. So I don't, I don't want to cut people off who want to learn more from you um, and see more of the things that you're thinking about and doing. So for folks that like want to dig deeper, you know, double click on some of these topics, where can they find, where can they find that information? Yeah. Well, thank you. And and you just gave me you know, a big tease here. I'm just rolling, rolling into this stuff heavily. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but uh, I, I love talking to your hunting, but uh uh, you can you can find uh, a lot of my stuff my website eastmeetswesthunt.com there's a lot of links to the podcast is where I have longer form conversations about it some shorter form stuff uh, my YouTube channel is just under my name Bo Martonic um, and then social media either Bo Martonic or East Meets West Hunt and you can kind of find all of my stuff there and then outdoor class is where I have basically the information I put out there but curated in a way that kind of takes you through a step-by-step -step approach that's uh yeah outdoorclass.com yeah, but i didn't want to disrupt the flow because i mean i have a list of things i wanted to talk about big woods versus mountain deer oh. navigating through water areas clear cuts and things that you know that, that we just we didn't we ran out of time for we'll have to have you back on but uh, again i know for a fact you've written about it so everybody's yeah. listening this is the hook this is how we get you hooked on a little bow. You know, you got a little <laughs> try a little bow before you're full on addicted. So go check it out. Um, everybody, thank you for, for listening and for supporting our show. We, we could not do this without you. We very, very, very much appreciate all the support. And uh, Bo, again, thank you for the time. Very, very much appreciate that. Too. Yeah, no, thank you for having me on. I always enjoy it.